It's working out which photographs you, you actually really liked along that way. Yeah. And, and finding that, yes, you do have a style, or a style is slowly developing, but then don't ever worry about having a style because styles just happen. It's who you, you are. You don't make it. Yeah. It, just, it, just, it comes from doing. Yeah. yeah. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Canon Conversations, the show where I sit down with some of the top creatives in the industry so that you can become a better photographer. Uh, on today's show, uh, we are diving into uh, everything you need to know on landscape photography and specifically how you can be more creative with your landscape photography. And to guide us on our journey today, we have uh, two legends in the game, uh, Mike Langford and Jackie Rankin. Guys, thanks for joining me. Pleasure. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks, Ben. Fantastic. Um, now, for anyone who um, isn't so, uh, familiar with your work and um, your workshops, uh, would you mind giving us a little bit of a background on your uh, history with photography and with teaching? Who goes first? Uh, well, you're yeah, younger, <laughs> so I guess you go okay. first. <laughs> All right. Well, we've both been photographers for about the same amount of time, but I, I started when I was 16 photographing greyhounds going past the post, uh, you know, 22 races in a day, trying to get that, that dog on the post and then progress to horses and people and weddings and photojournalism, all sorts of more manner of things in Australia. I lived uh, mm. in Goulburn, country New South Wales. And teaching TAFE. Oh yeah, so, okay, I, I was being quite brief, wasn't I? <laughs> Putting it down to about five seconds. <laughs> a, a lifetime of photography. Yeah, yeah so... Uh, I, I learned a lot of skills in those early years, all sorts of um, ways of photographing things that are moving, which I still love to do now and, and capturing them in that way. But uh, in 2002, I won Australian Professional Photographer of the Year with a series of images made upside down in an old biplane with my dad. Aerial Abstracts, I called it. And that was the, the first book that I've made that Mike influenced me with. And I guess, you know, we might talk a bit but about books today. Yeah, yeah. Um, then from that association with Canon, uh, things kept rolling along. And But through that work, I was actually exhibiting now and not doing so many weddings. And uh, that allowed me to express myself in a different way. And, oh, look, you know, where do I go from there, Mike? You talk, asked me to talk about TAFE, <laughs> I guess. You know, mm -hmm. I did. I started teaching. Yes, yeah, so I was teaching and that, that it freed up that economic part of me as well and allowed me to be a bit more expressive. So teaching at TAFE, then I guess that led on to us teaching here in New Zealand eventually. Mm. That, that's in a nutshell. We might expand on some of those things yeah. a little bit later, but yeah. <laughs> what about you? Yeah, uh, within that, Jackie uh, started exhibiting, which uh, brought up the, I guess, the fine art part of uh, her profile. Uh, Jackie tends to be more fine art orientated these days than myself. I'm more commercial. And I started, I, I guess I started... Uh, wanting to be a photographer at the age of 28, which is fairly late in life. Mm. Uh, but once once you sort of realise that you have a passion for something, it's really, it's a, it's a full-on pursuit. And so the question I had at that stage was, how do you become a professional photographer? And the, the options were quite limited. It was either taking an apprenticeship with uh, a, a professional who's all, already operating uh, doing an apprenticeship with the uh, a, a press, or one of the papers, or going to design school, which is what I ended up doing in Wellington. And at that stage, uh, which was 1980, uh, the, they only took 16 people a year into the only program on photography in the country at that stage, so it's quite limited. And at the end of that, uh, it was a one-year course, and at the end of it, I sort of realized that I actually knew nothing about photography, and so, I went to the head of the department and said, look, you've taught me I know nothing. Can I do a postgraduate in this? And he said, we don't have one. So I wrote one. Hmm. And at the end of that, I ended up uh, graduating with enough knowledge to actually start a business in photography. And that's commercial. So I started shooting for the Tourist Hotel Corporation, Mount Cook Line. Essentially, after my postgraduate, I had all my clients lined up and I worked for them for the rest of my life. So that, that, that was the start for me, got pretty lucky. Uh, and I was also fortunate enough to be involved in the day in the life in New Zealand. And that introduced me to a publisher called Malcolm McGregor, who's since passed away, but uh, he was based in Sydney. 
So when I moved to Sydney in 1984, I phoned him up and I said, hey, look, Malcolm, it's uh, Mike here from New Zealand. Uh, uh, I'm going to China. Uh, would you be interested in looking at my photographs from China? And he sort of fell for it and uh, said, OK, here's, a, <laughs> here's some money up front. Uh, you go to China and do some photographs from China. And it ended up being a book that I did with a, uh, another photographer called Jeff Mason. And that started my international publishing career that ended up being uh, books on North and South Korea, still the only photographic book on, on that subject, uh, The Four Seasons of Japan, and 26 books later, here's Jackie and I uh, publishing our own books and having a really good time of it. So that, that's that's me. Yeah, yeah. So we got together in about 2004, moved to New Zealand. Oh, actually, we got to better in 2002 that. we got together. <laughs> as soon as Jackie won an Australian yeah. Professional Photographer of the Year, I went... Gee, oh. she's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I need to hone in on that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. No, fantastic. Um, so you both have a really um, broad and varied, um, I guess, photographic career now, and both with quite different sort of um, avenues of approaching photography. You know, Mike with your more commercial side and Jackie with your more sort of fine art lens. Um, how do you think those varied sort of... Uh, backgrounds and how they've combined together with you as a couple have affected your aesthetics both together and then separately as individual f photographers well yeah uh, we are often say uh, Mike has helped me to be a bit more disciplined in my work <laughs> and Jackie's helped me to be a bit more <laughs> abstract in my work <laughs> yeah and as far as our clients go they love it because they get to be in a destination at a location and be able to glean off both both ways of seeing and find their own little vent that, that's that particularly them. Yeah, yeah. Normally, a client will actually uh, pick up uh, my structured ones and then say, "Well, love these abstract ones of Jackie's," and we'll have both things. So that, that works out really well. Yeah, because really, you have to create the discipline of doing it. You know, getting it right without having to, uh, I guess, delve into just moving the camera, and not really having that much control. It's mm. control and a good foundation in photography that really really counts. Mm. So ca causations are basically what drives me. I need to know who, what, where, why, uh, <laughs> and put all those factors together and, and make it work. And uh, Jackie's then got the freedom to actually become uh, the creative eye on, on the scene and bring bring her her elements to it, which is just wonderful. We, we've done a series of books, a uh, series of exhibitions actually called uh, Symbiosis, and, and it came out of a... Uh, a realization that we would both go somewhere and photograph in the landscape and we'd come home and look at each other's photographs and I'd say, where the hell were you, Jackie? <laughs> because <laughs> she had seen it in a way that I'd never even thought about it. So that became an exhibition where we'd hang our photographs of the same place at the same time together and it became really interesting. So we've done a, a few of those. Hmm. It, it also created a challenge, I think, for me and I, I would, we would stop at a destination and I would see Mike going a certain direction and I would either go, well, that's the shot over there because he's already pre-visualised pre it and know what he's doing. Or I would just have to sort of come back into myself and go, OK, well, where, is, where are my footprints going to go? And, and I find things on the way where Mike's already sort of pre got his idea down pat. But then I, I, I don't want to come. I know Mike's style a little bit. <laughs> maybe a bit big, I don't know. <laughs> and I would try and, and bring myself to it in a different way, deliberately. And, and that made me push myself even further and try skills and, and try techniques that hadn't been used before. As mm. cameras got better and they allowed for multiple exposure and, and camera gadgets got better, we got neutral density filters. ND10s. ND10s and yeah. all that kind mm. of stuff, all those innovative things. I just l grabbed hold of them, you know, took them on board and tried to see what I could do with them. Mm. Yeah, and Jackie took me kicking and screaming with her. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, you loved it. <laughs> yeah. Um, in terms of influences, are you guys sort of, I guess, um, just working off your sort of uh, contrasting styles as sort of like influencing off each other, or are you um, looking quite consciously out to other sort of either um, photographers or fine artists or other areas in the arts or? you know, beyond that to oh. um, gain influence for, for your work? Yeah, 
Mark would always say, you're only mm. as good as all the influences you've ever had, mm. and you, so you need to reach out and, and obviously take it in. Yeah, but we're, we're both, uh, we expose ourselves to as many different styles and ideas as we can, just so we can keep growing, um, uh, both within, within ourselves uh, and together and also outside of ourselves, because we teach. So we need to do that as well. Yeah, we need to upskill in even in areas mm. that we don't maybe particularly enjoy the most. Correct. Yeah. 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 And I, I guess that's a great segue into teaching itself. What about teaching um, appeal to you guys in terms of a way to either support or just, you know, a way to incorporate that into your photographic careers? Uh, it's kind of natural, really. I think we're both mm. very patient people. And we care about others. We want them to get better at their doing. We're able to uh, step outside of just oh, I'm trying to get my shot and, and and look to make sure other students and people are, are, are getting in the G of it. And we have enough time on our own as well to, uh, to, to express ourselves and push our own boundaries. Would you say that? Yeah. Uh, our groups, uh, the groups we teach are small. So uh, mm. most of the time it's... Uh, one tutor to three students, which is a pretty good ratio, and mm-hmm. and it gives us time. Uh, any location we're there for quite a quite a long time. So, if people have got questions, they can ask us. Uh, we normally check up, uh, just see what they're doing. Uh, most people like their own creativity, and really, our role is to just guide them as opposed to teach them. So, I'd, I'd see myself more as a photographic guide mm-hmm. than a teacher. Uh, yeah, a, a lot of that learning comes back when we get back to the hotel and we've downloaded images and we, we look at their photographs as well and give them that those critiques, uh, helpful critiques, you know. Uh, constructive, constructive critiques. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they get to see what we've been doing and get either get inspired by it and try something similar, but they will often see images that other people have put up for a review and they will think, well, I've, I've got something similar to that, but I didn't think it was okay. And maybe, maybe it is all right. So yeah. it, it's getting yeah. over that, the fear factor. Mm. Uh, the, the other thing uh, that's really important is when you've been uh, photographing for 40 years, which is what mm. we've, we've been doing each, uh, you gain a lot of knowledge. Uh, and most of the knowledge comes from having made a huge number of mistakes. Uh, now, knowledge isn't something that we own. It, it's something that we sort of put out there into the ethos and, and people either pick it up or they don't, but it's their choice. But our choice is to offer it, uh, and I think that's what we do most. Yeah, yeah. Uh, people enjoy the banter that happens between us. It's, <laughs> it's not like, you know, we're, we're, there are a lot of photographic couples, even men couples mm. out there who, who take workshops, and I think mm. that's all part of the flavour. Mm. Uh, from, yeah, we're not necessarily good cop, bad cop. We're sort of just different <laughs> points of view, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> There's a certain amount of love that goes in there, too. Yeah. It's all, all good. Yeah. yeah. I love it. Um, it. I guess sort of transitioning now to sort of going into maybe some of your teaching styles and sort of focusing on the fundamentals of, say, landscape photography. Um, what are some of the things you like to teach people um, who are sort of starting out their photographic journey? What's some of the sort of fundamentals you like t- to, to teach? Oh, Unders- <laughs> Yeah, basically <laughs> understanding the, 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 the basic principles of photography, which is, you know, people tend to rush off and and sort of do what's what's latest or what's greatest without understanding mm-hmm. how to get there. So we we're always going back to the basics, uh, and I think that's a really important thing to do. Yeah, you know that why choose that aperture? Why choose that shutter speed? Why that ISO? Why that lens? Why stand where you're standing? Uh, you know, are you telling people how high your tripod is, or you know, <laughs> what are you trying to say? So we we always go back to the basics. Yes, yeah, good. And we have tutorials that go through that, and it's mm. interesting. We think, oh, should we put this up? Maybe these these guys are a bit more advanced, but they will always get get some sort of jewel out of it. They, they things that they forgot because mm. they've they've scooted through those fundamentals through YouTube videos and being out with camera clubs or or just on their own, and they think they know it, but often they go, oh, I forgot about that. 
I forgot about how a lens communicates in different ways. You know, mm. is it about what you can see from where you are, something small, or is it is it about that big environment that's more of an environmental? Yeah, where you're standing. Standing, yeah. Mm. Here I am, and then that's in the mid ground and background and filling it all in. We don't probably chase the classic, um, the classic <laughs> shots as much because you know there's there's certain places oh well we do it actually in one well, we do. tree you know uh, the Wanaka tree let's have that as an example well that's that's a that's the hardest one especially since they've started cutting limbs off that's made it really <laughs> difficult <laughs> okay so we'll still go we'll go to this uh this famous tree in Wanaka uh, as a mm. way of of warming people up for the workshop of, about looking for separation about looking for the right shutter speed the right height looking at the light understanding the light yeah uh, so there's a plethora of techniques that come through in, in any shoot, isn't there? Yeah, we so, call it doing your scales. Uh, and you need mm -hmm. to do your scales to get your creative juices going. And, and, and it's like uh, there's a lot of people doing in-camera movement at the moment. And the question that is always good to ask is, do you know the recipe that gives that specific result? Because if you don't, then you can't repeat it. So repeatability of an idea is a very important thing to grow from. Mm. Mm -hmm. So something that's just randomly uh, found uh, and you can't repeat it means you actually haven't really uh, resolved that shot yet. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I guess we turn up at a pretty place. We mm. try and make the, the best chocolate box possible <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> chocolate boxes are really yeah. difficult <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> really difficult and then you know then move on and and explore those other creative techniques yeah mm. get that shot in yeah. is there a particular like sort of i guess skill or craft or idea that you find people often struggle to wrap their head around when they're starting out is there any of those sort of like those scales like you mentioned that are hard to really stick in people's head yeah, uh, and we, we try and we actually try and uh, give people that grounding so that they they understand the principle before they actually go out and apply it. So uh, we, as a precursor to most of our workshops, we actually do the basic stuff time and time and time again. And and every time we do it, we actually are reminding ourselves about all that stuff as well. Yeah, yeah. often we'll walk around and we'll go, "What's your subject? Yeah, how big is the subject mm. in the frame?" Is the subject compromised by anything in the background? Is there good light on the subject? Is the better light going to happen in five minutes' time? Look over your shoulder and check it out. Yeah, and we've How slowed do down a, a bit yeah. too. We, we, it, gee, when I was starting photography, I used to miss so many shots because I thought it was somewhere else. <laughs> I used to <laughs> run around like a chicken with its head cut off, and now I'm, I'm much, much happier to sit and see what resolves from uh, been there because yeah, you just got to sit and wait sometimes and have an idea and if that idea doesn't present itself uh, then adapt to what is there uh, and that takes you know, a bit of meditation a bit of slowing down mm. yeah yeah and you, you you mentioned it just before but um one of my other questions was basically has um, the the craft of teaching photography made you rethink your own craft, and you just mentioned that it did there before. What like um, for teaching for so long? Like, how's that sort of starting to affect your craft? Do you feel like you are sort of like relearning and understanding those fundamentals in a different way as you sort of teach them over and over again? Um, I, I guess we're seeing uh, another another way of it's part of our income, of course, teaching. Mm -hmm. And, and making books. So mm. I will tend to turn up in a situation and if I've made a mistake at the beginning, I don't delete that later on. I keep it mm. because being able to see the difference between something that was incorrect and then seeing it correct is a better way of, of teaching and, and showing mm. people, uh, just giving them an idea that this is the best shot is, is not as good as showing those before and after shots. And that's what our, our books have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Whether, whether that gets in the way of some of the creative flow along the way, perhaps it did earlier on, but I don't think it does so much now. Uh, you mature into it. We've been teaching, mm -hmm. well, here in, in New Zealand for 15 years, about that, 16 years? 16 years, yeah. And so, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're stuck with it and, and that's a good, uh, probably a good barometer that 
that we're doing it okay and our, and our lifestyle's fine and we're still shooting and making mm. photographs that are being celebrated just the recent mm. awards we've done quite well <laughs> you <Yeah>. have <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah I, had a, I had my first yeah 98 that was pretty cool uh, it's uh, oh, behind yeah. behind Jackie uh, oh, oh yeah this one here. Oh, yeah. yeah print yeah yeah wow. and we still now that's part of it too we still print which is great. Mm. Yeah, we print our work. We hang it around the house. We we swap prints in and out of the frames. So we we, we get to keep them fresh, and that's always the challenge too. You know, for each other, just to um, find another print to put up on the wall and keep it going. Yeah, yeah it's never that, ending, really. Well, we, it's the same with clients. We we've, we've got clients now that have done six workshops with us, and it's not because they failed each workshop. It's because they they keep wanting to grow and become better with each workshop and. Uh, that's how we felt about it as well. You take them to a certain point and then you allow them to grow from that point by supporting them, believing in them. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, well, I guess that's a, a great place to transition now into sort of like once people have the, the fundamentals, and the fundamentals and the basics under their belt, where do you take them from there? What's the next sort of step in the learning process that you see? Well, a part of it is the print because, you know, we do mm. print work and we also make books from our workshops and their images become eight to ten pages of that book mm. and that encourages them they see that that's okay they, they will then help hopefully make books of their own particularly of, of past trips or or even an art book of some sort what yeah do you think, Mike? Uh, the idea of books is that uh, it, it exists sort of out out in front for people if it's uh, just a digital file uh, you get to see it all the time but no one else does Mm. Uh, so, so making books is making your your work more public, mm. uh, and especially if it's a, a book that's for retail somewhere, mm. yeah, it means that you're you're proud of what you're doing and you're sharing uh, you're sharing those ideas with other people. Um, I think it's healthy. Yeah, book, books also mm. uh, require a certain uh, different aesthetic that the, the images need to flow through those eight mm-hmm. pages if they got those, mm. or if it's a, their own book, it, it needs to have what's the book about. Where's the direction? Where's the opening pages? Mike, no, Mike, you know all about books. <laughs> Come on. Well, the, the whole thing with books is, uh, you know, don't repeat yourself. If, you, if you've got a, a shot that does something, let that one shot do it. Uh, don't put 10 of that shot up because that just dilutes the power of uh, the idea. Mm. So keeping it simple is very, very important. And, and also don't clutter your books. You know, uh, there's so many people you see... Uh, photographs on a page and there's 10 on the page whereas mm-hmm. you know maybe one's enough well it's, it's it's what kind of book it is i guess yeah it's an art a landscape an mm. art book that, that is usually one maybe maximum two photographs mm. but but there's also that also brings in that idea of creating series and bodies of work uh maybe chapters yeah uh it just keeps going on you know mm-hmm. but the intent's the most important thing people need to know why uh why you've done what you've done and uh, when you see a, a book that's just got photographs in it uh, it's really difficult to understand the intent of the the creator of the book so always uh, let people know what your idea is and, and then give them a, a passage uh, a start and a finish and a body and a, a climax somewhere in it and mm. you know sort of talk to them you know communicate with them because that's what books are the visual communications yeah yeah no I agree and I think it's it's something that I think people come to like eventually and later on in their sort of photographic journeys like people start out with trying to make a pretty image and they're trying to use this this tool to capture the world around them and then only as you start to sort of um, understand and get familiar with that tool that you realize you can start to say things with it and yeah. by you know reading um, other other photographers' books, other artists' books, seeing how they talk about their work, um, can inspire you to think about your own work and think, oh, what what do I want to say? How do I want to say it? How is my photography going to help to um, communicate that message? And then how am I going to you know put that and in, you know potentially into a book and explain that and sort of help people in their process along the way? It's all a sort of circular conversation. Yes. Mm. Yeah, and I think that practicing to write. Mm is mm. part of that yeah. so you know uh, many many of our clients are on Facebook and Instagram but writing about the photographs as you put them up at, the, at least a few sentences mm. is a good place to start instead of just putting up some photos and putting up 50 yeah. it might be best to put up one at a time and take that mm. time out to 
describe for yourself, you know, and do yeah. those practicing things. Mm. Yeah, yeah I, I think the people need to understand what it is that you're trying to communicate with what you're showing. So, so mm. many times a photograph is just a photograph that has no meaning to anyone <laughs> without some sort of disclosure. Mm. Mm. Exactly. It's like when you walk into a gate gallery and you see a, an image and there's a, a wall label next to it, you know, it gives you context. Yeah, it does. To yeah. That. yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess let's transition now to talking a little bit about your, your books in particular. Um, and you've got two books on creative landscape photography and also some books on um, travel photography. And while sort of uh, uh, travel is kind of <laughs> off the cards at the moment, um, we're going to be looking at all your all of your books and uh, trying to pick out some learnings from there. Oh, so, um, you know, you can travel out your back door. You, you, you don't can, have to go well, far. Well, that's the thing is you can actually. And I think a lot of people are going to be um, exploring um you know their own backyard and 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 our own country now um, over the c- coming months, and it's a, actually probably a fantastic way to look at um, those lessons in travel photography and take a less kind of I guess exotic approach to it, and and you know think about um, traveling in our own backyard and 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 exploring it with a new lens. So um, let's talk now about your books, and I want to kind of um, pick out the word creative and all of that and and what you i guess consider to be creative landscape photography versus regular in inverted inverted commas um landscape <laughs> photography mm. right well mm. we began as queenstown center for creative photography mm-hmm. qccp the russian russian federation, federation. <laughs> <laughs> so creative just was in there as a way of of going outside the box i guess a sense of going outside the normal foundations of photography and, and pushing those boundaries yeah yeah but but with the understanding that you, you know where you're coming from and where you're going so it's it's that it's a path if you like creativity is the uh, the ultimate expression of you and the landscape uh, I mean let's stay with the landscape because landscapes travel as well mm. so you know when you're looking at a landscape you're not just looking at what you've seen before you're looking at how you feel at that time and what you're thinking at that time and and planting those elements into that landscape is the purpose it's not just uh, it's like uh, looking and seeing when you look at something you don't really understand it it's a glance it's a flash in the pan when you see something it's about understanding what it is you want to say about it so uh, that's a huge transition so the, the purpose of the books, mm-hmm. uh, can, I, can I just sort of go back to that just for a second? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Please the pur- purpose of the books was mm-hmm. at the end of a course, people would say, you know, after four days, four or five days of mm-hmm. talking about photography, they say, have you got that in writing somewhere? And because, you know, you, you, you learn and then you forget. And so the idea of the book is that constant reminder. And a lot of mm-hmm. people actually, uh, we, we've titled them field guides. Mm. And the field guides, because they're designed to put into your camera bag, and a lot of people have actually bought a second one because the first one totally got munted mm. uh, by being in the camera bag and getting wet and all sorts of things. So uh, it's a very practical. Uh, the, a lot of recipes in there using yeah. lots of different techniques. Yeah, and I, I just remembered something. You asked me about that word creative again. Mm-hmm. A lot of people think they're not creative. Mm. How do I how do I put on my creative sort of button? How do I do that? And mm. and I, and I think that's one of the reasons why we use that word creative to entice people to learn creativity. And I think you can learn it. I think you can practice it. And mm. it, and it's a it's a matter of sometimes doing uh, those fundamental things, and then and then just keeping on going and believing in yourself and having others around you that help you and encourage you to do that instead of perhaps um, yeah, maybe people at, at home who are not photographers just saying, oh, that, that looks, I don't understand it, or that looks mm. kind of strange or whatever, uh, being able to be constructive in that. And coming back to those recipes that Mike was talking about, it is a certain place where you can start. Um, we could start with, which, which one, Mike? <laughs> which, the I was, I was just going to say, do, do, you, do you have any favourite takeaways or, or recipes from the book that you guys are sort of... Uh, m- well, most enjoy sharing? No, well, most of the uh, photographs in the book aren't necessarily our favourite photographs. They're just mm. ones that illustrate concepts best. Mm. So it's, it's, 
our books aren't about uh, great photographs. They're about uh, interesting ideas. Yeah. And, and enjoying yourself out in the field. Yeah. yeah. Mm. What, what can you do at different places where there's hundreds and hundreds of people or at the beach, you know, I'm thinking about Australia and New Zealand now. Mm. How can you get rid of people and make them all blurs? You know, that's where mm. those, that 10 stop filter will, will slow mm. the shutter speed down. So I guess, it, I, I think it's um, being able to make photographs that your eye can't see. I, mm. I find that really interesting. We can't see in multiple exposures and I really enjoy that technique. But it, it does, there's a, a lot of failures that come along with that at the same time. Yeah. Mm. And then it's knowing when you get a good one, but also practicing a technique that does work over and over again and allowing for serendipity to come into your life that, that something happens unexpectedly, a, a light turns on or something like that, that mm. made it really special that you didn't pre-visualize and then being able to look at the final finish, or the image that comes out of the camera and knowing that that's, that's, the, that's the shot that worked in amongst 10 that perhaps didn't work. Mm. Well, let's take the, uh, Jackie just uh, won a uh, high scoring print on the recent NZIPP awards. Mm. Uh, that was actually, uh, the category she won was sponsored by Canon, mm. which is a wonderful thing. And <laughs> Thank you, Canon. Yeah, uh, so, I uh, The image that we're talking about is the one behind, uh, behind Jackie up, up here. Yeah, we'll probably bring it up on your screen later. Yeah. Mm. Oh, we, yeah. We'll send you that file we'll send so you people file. can see it closer. Mm. And it was you know, five images taken consecutively over the top of one another, moving the camera a little mm. bit, changing the exposures between each one so one would dominate. And the serendipity part of that was that on one frame, the there was a billboard that lit up and it became mm. a, dominant, a little dominant element that, that sat on top and, and changed the aesthetic and also created a bit of a riddle of how come there's just one of that frame and everything else is mm. smuddly and and quite abstract and Mike's uh, yeah. got another idea here uh, and it's all it's all in camera uh, so mm. uh, it's, it's about as Jackie said you can't see multiple expo exposures mm. but you can think them mm. <laughs> and it's a matter of taking that thought that idea and then transposing it into mm. an image mm. uh, I've got one here uh, mm. in, in this book which mm. is a, a it's just two exposures and it's something that uh, I hadn't seen before it's in camera uh, mm. And what I ended up doing was changing the white balance. Ah, uh, nice. Uh, so one of them's got a, a white balance, which is... Uh, uh, like a tungsten. 56, and then, then you've got tungsten. a 32, yeah. Well, it's actually, a, it's a 32 and then a 1,000 a, a Kelvin. <laughs> 10,000 yeah. Kelvin. I just, just got to read no. the recipe. Yeah, so there's a recipe. <laughs> read the recipe. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it came out of trying to... Yeah. Uh, communicate a, a visual depth to a photograph mm. mm -hmm. and instead of just having a, a multiple exposure um, that gives you a, a close and, and then a, a wider one a context of space it also gives you a, a context of visual depth which we know cold colors uh, that they recede warm colors mm. advance and when you put those mm. together in a frame you've got this visual depth which is really quite exciting so those are the sorts of things that we, we like doing mm. so. yeah see that's mike challenging himself to try and do something <laughs> that hadn't been done before i hadn't had thought of that i often do my work in black and white yeah uh, mm. but but we'll shoot a raw and a jpeg at the same time yeah. you know i do that i do that often and that because i i often love what comes out of the the camera, the, the a black and white JPEG looks yeah. can often mm. look great to me, because I want yeah. whites blown out, you know, and I yeah. want some of those blacks, and it's a bit grungy, and it's not as mm. not as hasn't got all the tonal range, but it, and then I take it even further. Uh, yeah. And that's the other thing with the Canon is that uh, mm. you can choose to keep every every frame, every file frame, and so that when you get back mm. to your computer, if you want to change your mind about things, you can. Yeah, and I, I, I want to pick out some things that you've just mentioned there um, because it's an area of photography that I'm, I'm really interested in. You mentioned some things like um, your sort of uh, blurred elements, like multiple exposure blur elements. You've mentioned um, the sort of different white balances, um, and then you've mentioned um, blown out highlights. And all of these things are basically like, could be considered like bad parts of a photo. Blurriness, <laughs> blown out highlights incorrect white balance um uh, can you guys talk a little bit to i guess um when you 
throw out the rule book when you ignore those rules and how do you do that creatively and when sort of something is objectively wrong how that can be right yeah that's great i, I love what you've just said just, that's fantastic yeah. i can that's it you just said it's all right at yeah. some stage yeah. <laughs> and I, I guess you do it with other people around you that mm. will give you some feedback on that that helps uh, but also being able to see that other people are thrown out the rule book is all right too you're still still knowing knowing that it, the aesthetics of that that some some images can look quite garish and that, that you're choosing that not every image needs to be pretty um, they can be somber and blue even that blue one Mike oh okay here's a very uh, blue monkey a very blue mm. monkey uh, uh, and the idea was to say the word cold mm. so if it's the snow monkey it shouldn't look warm because it's actually saying the wrong thing so it's a matter of saying you know when we talk about color we're talking about an emotional element of the camera so color is the emotional context um, in black and white uh, that's totally different but it doesn't have the emotional context so what I try and do with color is either say warm and happy or cold and prickly or dangerous if I go into the red realms so mm. you, you sort of read color and think about does it support or detract from what I want to say yeah, and we, we'll often ask people to describe what they're seeing and how they're feeling at the time of shooting, and that, that helps them get an idea, is it cold? And do you want to make it feel cold and do it cold, make it cold at the time? Yeah. 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 So descriptive words are a really good way of, of saying, oh, is it some kind of mood, mm. is it ethereal? Mm. Does it feel, make you feel light and is this the kind of feeling you want? That's where you go to those high keys and, blow, and deliberately blow them out. You can't, mm. doing it later in the computer has a quite a different look. So it would be to do a different look. And, and it would be a bracketing would be the good thing to do, where you do maybe a, a darker shot and then progressively go beyond and break those boundaries and, and, and so-called. Yeah, you've you've just pressed a, right. another what? little button. Uh, and the other button is uh, you can do anything you like uh, in your computer, uh, mm. but you're in a totally different environment. and. Most times when you're in front of your computer, you have a mindset that you, you you would increase a bit of saturation, a bit of contrast, you do this, you do that. And you have a palette that you do to just about everything that you, you know, create. Uh, when you're in the field, uh, the question always is, how can I actually make it feel like what I'm feeling like now? And so the JPEG out of the camera is, a, is hugely about... Um, uh, it's almost like it's a little thumbnail of the moment, which is quite different from post post production on the computer. So yeah. mm. we teach the moment uh, a lot more than we do post production. Yeah, mm. just a, a little tip: if you do this when you're using Lightroom, you have to make sure you go to the preference pane and tick import the RAW and the JPEG together. Otherwise, people come back and they go, I did all this really hard work and all I can see is the RAW file that comes up looking pretty drab. Yeah. Let me press the auto yeah. button that's going to fix it up and make it into yeah. a chunk of box I'm used to. <laughs> so the JPEG alongside, you go, wow, that's what I was looking and feeling like. Let me try and express this in a different way, not just go back. Because computers and programs have auto settings too, don't they? Yeah, mm, absolutely. And it's not to say that post-processing is bad, but you need to understand yeah. what you're doing and... Yeah, like going as far down the road as you can on site and camera um, lets you understand that post-processing, you know, part of the workflow a bit more. So you aren't just simply like, how do I make this not look, you know, unsaturated, bump the saturation up. I mean, you just do the same thing over and over again. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm. Um, I guess I, 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 as we sort of round out the show now, I wanted to sort of, speak to a couple of things you just um, mentioned around uh, basically like the feeling of a photo and like what it says and and because I think you know a lot of people might look at especially especially a, a landscape photo and just and say it's just a record of the what I'm looking at it's just a just you know it's the that's just the landscape can landscape photos or photos in general um, like how do they say something more and like can they be can they say something compared to just being a record of the physical world 
Well, I, I do that a lot. Mm. I, mm. I make my landscapes into something quite different by throwing teapots into them or saucepans and <laughs> holding Phones up forks. Yeah, through the air. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, through, through the air. Yeah. I mean, and when I'm doing that, I'm, I'm, I was always looking for separation and the right shutter speed and those kind of things. Has that gone a bit too wild for you? Mm. Uh, so landscape photographs about turning up is about turning up with the right technique for the right subject and using all that all the practice you've used in the past to apply something and sing that song really well. I think Jackie's nailed it. Uh, 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 an appropriate technique is the thing that you uh, once you've once you've worked out what you want to say, it's got to be the technique that actually reinforces that. Uh, a lot of people use technique for technique sake, which doesn't end up saying much at all. It's just about the technique and. As judges, we've both been judges for over 30 years, uh, one of the questions always is, is, is the technique appropriate to the communication? Yeah, the next thing I, I think is, it's very hard for a photograph to feel emotive when it's just on your computer. It's so much better when you make a print of it, mm. uh, particularly a matte print, a fine art mm. matte print. And you show that to other people and they go, wow, is, is this a painting? Yeah. Or it, so, it feels so different for mm. them who are, Gen, a general public who have never seen that you know fine quality matte prints and and they, they that, that's another way of, of making that a more emotive and do you want to talk about your encaustics behind you do you want to grab one and just talk oh about yeah it? okay yeah. you got so, time for this yeah. just, absolutely just little, we've got all the time yeah. in the world all oh, right 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 <laughs> so this is just a, a little thing that i've been working on recently it, you can see it's it's wax wax over the top of prints uh, i can engrave into them and impress into the wax and put ink and all sorts of multimedia so that yeah. finishing things off in different ways is a really exciting thing mm -hmm. for people and me particularly at the moment yeah. I'm really loving it it's just one that's there I've got dozens outside in yeah. my studio space they're oh, little, fantastic yeah just and for me this is a new skill and and mm. and I'm just taking a step at a time I'm not trying to do everything all at once I'm I'm being quite methodical in about about the learning because uh, so I'm not applying any colour, it's all just black, uh, black inks or white inks and, and grey and a white background and I'm slowly moving through it because it is, that's a huge area on its own, encaustic painting, you can even make paintings mm. out of this stuff but but I'm really enjoying that. Yeah. 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 So, you and know, I mean, that's another skill. Yeah, well, I was just going to say, you, you've, you've just answered one of my last questions questions which was are you learning any new techniques <laughs> still and you and you've just answered that there and and you've just uh, illustrated that you know photography and 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 art and creativity is just this ongoing process that you can always find something new to learn totally yeah 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 yeah, yeah. and yeah. and also just honing those skills writing about your mm -hmm. work going back through those libraries of images that you have and being able to put put, put books together um, mike mm -hmm. in the last lockdown made two lockdown books <laughs> one was our view 10 years of view from our deck in queenstown mm. when we're living so the criteria was that every photograph had to be taken from the lounge uh, deck uh, and mm. the other one was a, a book called manscapes uh, during the lockdown of course we weren't allowed to go very far so i went through my archive and started to notice that i'd been photographing uh, man's influence on the landscape regularly you know, it could be power pylons it could be dams it could be irrigation things who knows and i went oh, these are manscapes i'll start <laughs> doing a series of manscapes so i put together a book called manscapes yeah fantastic <laughs> yeah. No, nothing to do with body hair and the stuff, i was just going to say manscapes <laughs> has got a potentially a different connotation there to it um but i like the boldness of of of, of word choice there um i so my last question to, to to round out the show is um basically um if you have any sort of i guess final advice any final sort of parting advice um for photographers who maybe have sort of uh found themselves in a bit of a rut with their creativity and their craft um you know specific especially relevant with the sort of COVID lockdowns, you know, some creatives flourish, but others found themselves in a bit of a rut. Do you have any advice for um, creatives who sort of can sort of break the mold and find a new way to sort of see their craft from a different angle? All right. Well, I'll sort of come back to a few, th once, something you said there about being in mm. uh, lockdown and not being able to mm. get out. 
one way that I connected with some of our, our clients was to create some uh, online Zoom sessions mm. where the group, groups would come together, little micro groups of five or six people that can work together and inspire each other. And, and I, I know from their feedback that they found that really good. Just having somebody there and a group there to inspire them to keep, pick up the camera every day and practice. Mm. And I would give them a challenge um, and they would come all come back with something a little bit different or sort of the same and they would share it in, a, in another micro Facebook page group and I found that w- that was really good. So I would take practice and, yeah. then, and then being with others. But and The one one thing I'd suggest is look through your archive. Um, you know, re-enthuse yourself through what you've done. Uh, work out where you, where you might have been going that you hadn't assessed and go there. Do it. <laughs> Get yeah, up it's, there. it yeah. is. It's it's working out which photographs you, you actually really liked along that way, mm. yeah. and and finding that yes, you do have a style, or a style is slowly developing. But then don't ever worry about having a style because styles just happen. It's who you, you are. You don't make it. Yeah. It just it just it comes from doing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Oh, that's fantastic advice. Um, and that's a great great place to to finish. Really. Um, just. I guess looking back inward and looking at what you've done and trying to look at it with a new lens um, is yeah a, a really great thing for photographers to hear. Um, thank you guys both for your great. time and for sharing your your, your knowledge. Um, yeah, I've, I've had a really great time getting to meet you guys and and chatting through through your work. Yeah, you too, Ben. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Ben. And thanks for the opportunity. Alrighty. Yeah. Fantastic. Alrighty, guys. Well, um, I hope you enjoyed the show, and um, we'll have uh, links to um, Mike and Jackie's work as well as their books uh, below. And uh, yeah, thank you guys again, and we'll see you guys next time. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.